probably have some other people trickle in, which is perfectly fine. Uh, but first, I just want to thank everyone that's in attendance for taking time out of your evening to join us for this. Uh, this is one of the Fish Natural web seminars that we're doing. And this one, as you know from signing up, is going to be covering uh, hard body lures. Uh, my name is John Burden. I work with the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission's Fishing Education Program. And so our purpose is to go out and help build people's skills and knowledge of fishing and the tackle in this case that goes along with it um, so that you can either get into fishing, uh, you know, have a broader understanding of fishing and go target other species maybe you've had issues with, uh, but overall just trying to enhance people's experience of fishing. Um, so that's kind of the, the general premise of our program. Uh, but tonight, like I said, we're gonna be focusing on hard body lures. Um, some of you, may I know that there's a, a category called soft plastics. Um, I, I was originally going to try to blend some of that information here, but once I started compiling the list of what information I wanted to, to, to give to you, uh, I realized that we probably, you know, have more material than we could possibly cover in just this one setting. Um, so, you know, if that's something you're curious about, keep an eye out. We'll probably do a follow-up uh, program just for uh, soft plastics, as that's a completely other group of lures that are very popular artificial lures. Um, so, first off, uh, you know, some people, if you've been fishing or you haven't been fishing, um, I want to talk about the benefits of these hard body lures. Uh, if, if you do have any questions throughout the, the discussion, uh, if you will, please put any questions in the chat. Uh, at the end of uh, my presentation, we're going to double back on that, pull any kind of questions that you have there, and, and we'll go over that at the end of it. Um, but I want to start with just telling you what really the benefits of these hard body lures are. Um, one thing about them that I think is uh, highly important is that rather than having to go and collect or purchase live bait, such as worms, crickets, or minnows. Uh, hard body lures are something that you can keep in your tackle bag all the time. So, you know, for me personally, I keep a tackle bag and a small rod in my vehicle. And that way, you know, if I happen to have some free time or maybe I, you know, happen to be in a new area, I can take that fishing gear out and go straight out to the water and start fishing right away. It's not something that I have to necessarily plan or worry about. Uh, it's just something that's always there available. And so that's one of the biggest benefits to it to me. Um, another benefit is that, you know, presuming that you don't lose it, which does happen, um, that's something that you can have for a long time. Um, you know, these lures, most of them are, are made of a high quality plastic, some of their metal, we'll get into that. Um, but the biggest upkeep on those usually is gonna be just changed out the hooks themselves. So, you know, you can have one lure and fish it many, many times say it gets caught, but you retrieve it, and then the barb is bent on the hook, or maybe the hook is messed up altogether, you can just take that off and replace it. So it's, it's not just a piece of terminal tackle, but it's a presentation that you can use for fishing over a long period of time. So as I kind of alluded to, um, there's different materials used for these hard body plastics, or hard body lures, excuse me. Uh, plastic is probably by and large the, the most popular um, in the past, they were traditionally made from wood, uh, you know, carved items, uh, maybe with some metal fittings on them, but, uh, you know, traditionally that was what they were made of. But today we will definitely see more than uh, any other material is going to be, uh, you know, plastic molds. Um, but first, I want to talk a little bit about metal hard body lures. And so these are just small, simple uh, patterns that are very popular. Um, some people may have heard of them, some people may have not, and so I like to talk about them because I, I think they sometimes get overlooked uh, when people talk about these type of artificial lures. Most people just tend to focus on the plastic ones, uh, which is understandable, and we'll talk about, you know, the benefits of that. So the first one I want to talk about is what's called a spoon, and you'll see quickly why it gets that name. So this is the front side. I'll try to get these in focus for you guys as best I can. You know, bear with me on that. This is just a simple metal form that has been stamped to have a slight curve in it. Not all spoons will have a curve, but that's where they get the name generally is that they have that scoop shape to them. And you can see it's just a simple kind of a teardrop shape, has a single treble hook there on the end. And it may not look like this would be incredibly enticing to a fish, 
But really what this will do in the water is if you cast it out and retrieve it, this bend in the middle will catch water as you're retrieving it and will kind of shake back, back and forth. And you can see the glint coming off of it. And that glint is what is appetizing to the fish because this is going to kind of mimic a bait fish that is fleeing or maybe injured. Uh, and so that's going to signal to any kind of predator fish that, hey, maybe that's an easy meal. And so that flash is really the important part uh, as far as getting their initial intention. But what it also does is the spoon shape that's catching that water and it's causing it to flicker is also causing a lot of vibration in the water. And so in addition to visual, visual cues that we're trying to get in a fish to react, you're also gonna see, or well, rather they're gonna feel and hear the vibrations in the water. So a fish, they have ears just like we do, they're internal, uh, but they have a similar structure to our ears. They will feel and pick up on those vibrations there, but they'll also pick up on vibrations across their lateral line. That's a, a thin line running across their body, but it's a sensory organ. And so they'll pick up on the vibrations uh, just from this single little small uh, spoon. So it's a simple concept that hits on two different areas of fish that will get their attention and try to entice them to come in and get a bite. Now, they aren't all just simple metal, you know, stamps like this with no color. Here's one that's got a little more color on it. Somewhat kind of a trout pattern, I guess you would say, kind of a rainbow color. Here's another one different pattern there. And you'll see a huge variety in colors and patterns. There are also some different shapes. Not all of them are this kind of teardrop shape. Some of them are kind of a straight line, almost like an emery board or something like that. Uh, so they're not always gonna be exactly like this, but calling them spoons in general, uh, pretty much anyone's gonna know what you're talking about if you were to refer to that. And if you were to see them at the store label, that, that's, that's exactly what they're talking about. So another one that I like more than a spoon personally is another metal uh, lure. It's called a blade bait. And they call them a blade bait because here's one. It's a simple, simple little metal lure. And you can see how narrow it is when I turn it towards the camera. It's very narrow. So it kind of has a mimic of say a knife blade. And you know, as, as you see there, it definitely makes sense why. Now this one is a little different. You can see, unlike, unlike the other, the spoon that we were looking at, this one definitely has more features that are fish-like. You see the eyes there, kind of a head shape. Um, so it's more reminiscent of a fish, a bait fish that a predator fish would be going after. Uh, again, they utilize these treble hooks um, here. In this case, we have two, one at the front and one at the back because fish will sometimes hit from the side or the back. You know, they're not always just coming up behind the fish that they're trying to get. Um, these are interesting though, because they have these three different points here. Not all of them have that. Some blade baits will have a single hole in them, but what that allows for is you can do some separate uh, positioning on there to give different presentations. Now, another big thing about this is while the spoon would wobble back and forth, this one is going to kind of go side to side. And so it's gonna have more of a natural fish swimming action to it. And it also has, you can't hear it on this one because it's very small, but there is a tube here in the middle. Let's see if I can get it there. Right at the tip of my finger, there's a small tube and there are actually some small beads in there. And so those beads are gonna give extra vibration, extra percussion under the water uh, as this is moving side to side. So not only will you have that rapid side to side movement causing the vibrations like I was talking about earlier, uh, but those beads in there will just give you an extra level of percussion in the water uh, to help draw their attention. Uh, here's a, another pattern that I have. This one's kind of a mix between almost like a grasshopper, but also a small sunfish. And again, it's got similar structure, the three holes up there. Um, and these, when you wanna fish these, generally what you would do is just cast them out and do a steady retrieve. You can allow them to fall to the bottom and lift the tip of your rod and then let them fall back down, lift the tip of your rod. And then as you're letting them fall, reel in the excess. And so this will give you kind of a feeding motion 
of a bait fish off the bottom of the water. Uh, so that's one technique you can use. That's a, a different way than just a steady retrieve. Um, but there's absolutely nothing wrong with doing just a steady retrieve on these, uh, especially during warmer months. Um, you know, a lot of fish are more active and actively feeding. So they're willing to, to go after and expend that energy uh, to get them. Whereas in the winter, when things are colder, sometimes you have to have a little more finesse in your approach to get the fish interested. So those are just a couple of, of the metal lures there. Again, this is just going to cover a, a section of, of lures. There's other types that are, you know, inline spinners, spinners as a whole category um, that would fall into a metal construction. Um, but, but again, at this time, I'm just kind of focusing on the ones that kind of have a similar action and, and fall into this similar body shape. Um, and going from that, now we're going to get into the plastic category. So all these that I'm going to cover now, um, these are just different plastic molds that are used to give different presentations. Um, some of these you'll probably have seen and are somewhat familiar with. So hopefully I can explain a little more about it uh, so that we can clear up any questions you have. I know a lot of people when they go to uh, you know, Walmart or to Bass Pro or anywhere where there's a selection of lures, it can be kind of overwhelming and you may have an idea of what you think is good. Um, but there may be some details to help, you know, uh, that you weren't sure about as far as selection. Um, first, I'm going to talk about what's called a popper. And a popper, it falls from its name as far as the technique that it uses. And here's one here. Again, there's many varieties as far as colors, um, moldings can change and vary. Some are more simple. This one's a little more detailed. You can see there's actual uh, detailing on the molding to the face. Uh, but what's most important about these is the front here. I don't know if you can see that too well. It's a concave front and you actually tie your line here. There's a small eye. And so the idea of this is to be uh, a top water lure. So the other ones I had showed you, the spoon and the blade bait, those are both diving. Obviously they're made of metal, so they're going to sink in the water. Uh, this is going to do the opposite. This is going to set on top. And what the point of this, where you tie it and the shape of that front is that when you cast it out, it will lay on top of the water and then you twitch it, just gently twitch it. You can kind of do a side to side motion or just a single backward motion on your reel or excuse me, on your rod. And when you do that, that concave surface there in the mouth is going to catch the water. And so the popping comes from the sound that that's actually making when it's moving across the water when you twitch your rod. So it's called a popper, makes sense. And um, these are really highly effective, especially during the, during the summer months. I prefer to use them then myself. Um, there's some other ones we'll get into a little bit that are great for cold weather. Um, but these again, they fall into a pretty similar category all together. They're gonna have the slender body, just like this here. Most of them are gonna have at least two uh, treble hooks on there, but most importantly, they're gonna have that open mouth, that concave front to help make that popping, that percussive sound. And so we talked already about enticing fish using visual cues, but then also, you know, percussion in the water. Again, that's a great way to get a fish's attention. And this one here, you can actually hear, there's a rattle, some beads inside of this. And so not only are you getting the percussive force from the actual lure moving in the water, uh, but you're going to have those beads again, giving just a little extra interest to the fish because they're going to hear that and they're going to cue it and say, hey, what's that over there? Now, as far as the body and the coloration, this is, you know, colored just like a, in any other fish that you'd see in the water, dark on top, light on the bottom. And then, of course, the side is kind of painted up like maybe a bait fish. But whenever they see that motion on top of the water, they're going to think, oh, well, this is a fish that's injured or dying. And so that's an easy meal for me. And that's another thing that's going to cue those fish to come and, you know, hopefully hit this lure. Now there's a couple of varieties of poppers out there. Here's one that has some flash to the tail just to give some extra motion and interest. Here's one I like to use. It's actually supposed to mimic a frog. You can see it's got that front cuffed mouth. It's called a hula popper. And uh, it's got this little tail here. And the idea here is when you jerk it, these kind of flail out kind of like a frog's leg if he's kicking and swimming. Uh, so 
there's different varieties as far as how they look, different presentations, but the, the performance overall falling into the proper category uh, is what makes them the same. And again, has that nice open mouth, gonna get that percussive force there. Okay, uh, I know this, this one I'm gonna talk about right now, this is another top water lure, but it's one that has kind of fallen out in favor. I think they used to be a lot more popular, but I, I haven't personally seen a lot of people fishing with these anymore. Um, it's called a torpedo. Um, this is a torpedo bait here. You can see it's kind of a simple design, just a nice cylindrical body, tapers towards the end. And this one has a propeller on the end, which is pretty common for the torpedo shape uh, baits. Uh, again, two treble hooks. And this one, it doesn't have a rattle in it. Um, but what this propeller is for is to kind of replace that percussive action. So there's no hole in the front. This is going to pull smoothly through the water. But as you pull it, it's going to sit on top and the water is going to turn that propeller. And you can probably see as I'm doing it, it kind of causes a little bit of flash. Again, mimicking the movement of a fish in the water, a bait fish or whatever fish is, you know, hopefully the, the one you're trying to catch is going to be intrigued by. Um, but it also, as it's starting, is giving flash, but then it's doing the same thing, that percussive activity. And so they're going to feel, hear, and see this, uh, the action there. Um, you can work this in the same way. You don't have to do so much the, the finessing as far as a side to side walk or a slight pop, uh, cause that's not gonna give you a lot of action there. So this one would be good to do a retrieve, 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 pause, and then retrieve, 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 and pause. So you can kind of do a little breaks where it seems like it's you know trying to escape and stopping, trying to escape, stopping, and that's gonna get more interest from a fish uh, using this bait in particular. Okay, the, the next categories that we're going to move into are by far uh, the most popular, and they are certainly my favorite. Um, it's going to be crankbaits. Um, these are things you see all over the place. They come in all kinds of colors, all kinds of sizes. And that's what I was saying about there's a lot of times a hard place to start if you have a lot to choose from. It's hard to know which one you want to choose. So crankbaits, let me just pull in here, just to give you a general idea of what they're about crankbaits are let me see these lures here so again they're going to have usually two treble hooks one in the front one in the back you can see this one looks like a kind of like a bluegill or some kind of sunfish but what makes them very distinguishable are these bills in the front so these bills on crankbaits are how these are they dictate how these baits behave in the water so when you throw them they're hollow most of them are just going to float there are some that sink that are weighted but the action comes into play from this bill so if i were to cast it out and i start a slow retrieve just reeling it in this thing is going to start moving it's going to start moving side to side and this bill dictates that movement not only does the bill dictate the movement, but it dictates the depth that this is going to dive to. So let me get one for comparison here. You can see the two here, how much larger this one is than the one in, uh, in my left hand on the right side of the screen for you guys. So this larger bill is going to dive much deeper than this one. And that's, the, that's going to be standard for any of these crankbaits that you're looking at. The larger the bill, the deeper the dive. And so you can see how large this one is. This is probably going to be maybe six to eight feet. It's going to dive down as you're retrieving it. If you continue to retrieve it, it'll just continue to get water pushing against that bill and causing it to go deeper and deeper in the water. Whereas this one, it's only going to push so much resistance as you're pulling it. And so it's not going to dive as fast and or as deep. Now, another thing that you're probably noticing is the shape of these bills, and that is what dictates the motion. So if you have, there's, there's really three different patterns. So this one is kind of a square bill. This one's got the more oval shape. And this one has, if you can see, that's kind of a diamond shape. Most often you're gonna see them with a round 
rounded tip, or at least most that I think I've seen come like this. There's definitely plenty of a square, um, but this rounded tip is usually the most common. And what it'll do as you're pulling it, again, it'll cause it to dive, but then it also gives a slight wobble back and forth. And the faster you retrieve it, the faster you're reeling it in, the faster that wobble will go. But if you're doing just a slow, re steady retrieve, it'll kind of just do a slight wobble back and forth, back and forth, just giving a really nice uh, natural swimming motion. And that's where these get their name is just having a, you literally just kind of crank as you go. So they are crank bait, just crank them in and they'll come in. Now this one, like I said, the rounded edge or the rounded build to it just gives it a nice slow motion back and forth. Well, then we can contrast that with these two. You can see these both have pretty sharp angles on there, basically a square tip. And that squared off surface is what that's gonna do is give you a more erratic swim pattern. So instead of a nice slow wobble back and forth, this one's gonna give a tight shake back and forth as you're retrieving it. And this one you can hear, I think you can hear it. Uh, it has it has beads in there, so it rattles as well. And so again, you know, all these concepts on these lures are feeding off of two things. What does it look like when it's moving? Does it look swimming naturally? Does it look like a fish? Is it interesting? Um, and can they hear it? And so this wobbling motion, it's going to not only create a percussive uh, force, just like all the other ones will, but that bead in there will give you a little added advantage. And now I said that these kind of look like a fish. Well, here's an example of one that doesn't look so much like a natural fish. And uh, where this kind of comes into play is somewhat to do with the, the water quality as far as the clarity that you're in. You're gonna have you know, some waters that are more turbid or, or dirty. And so whenever you're in that situation, something like this with a brighter color could help you out because the fish is gonna be able to see it better. Even if they can hear it, they know it's moving over there. Uh, you know, maybe not being able to see it is going to cause an issue for you or for the fish to not bite. So you want to have a little extra color on there just to help make sure that they can locate it and take a bite, hopefully. Now, these come in all presentations and sizes. Uh, I've kind of looked at some of the bigger ones here. Um, here's another one, a little bitty guy. That one is kind of like a rainbow trout pattern there. This one is a bass here. But then we also have things like this, which is a grasshopper, as you can see. And this one's going to be pretty shallow. The small bill on there is probably going to go to about three feet or so. And then I have this one here. You can see that's actually molded to look like a, a group of bait fish swimming. So, you know, again, some of them are not going to necessarily have a natural pattern to them, but a lot of times you want to try to present something that's going to look similar to what the fish is already feeding on. And so in this case, you know, we got some shad in here. That's definitely something that they're going to go for. Uh, one of my personal favorites are the, the crawfish. These are very popular for me, at least using for spotted bass or smallmouth bass, because that's a common food source in small streams. And you can see here, these are coming different colors. And you may want to use a variety of colors at different times of the year uh, as these molt, or if you're in a different location, there's different species of crawfish. So maybe one location would be good uh, with this one here. It has more of a dark green back on it, uh, but others may go for just, you know, this more kind of normal looking uh, red and orange tone. So that's part of the reason you see the wide selection in presentations. It's not so much that we're, you know, just trying to make them look pretty. Uh, but that the fish are actually going to be more selective. And again, in, in clear water, uh, I've definitely had it be the case where I can throw one and they don't seem to care for it, but then I've switched out and throw another one that's maybe the same shape and even the same size, uh, but that color change uh, was just enough to make them, you know, believe uh, that it's actually something that they're used to eating and have, have them take a chance on it. So, that's crankbaits at large as they're normally seen, but uh, if that's not enough information, it gets deeper. And that's again, part of the reason I didn't wanna go into soft plastics is because this covers a lot of material. But there's a whole nother group called lipless crankbaits. 
also sometimes called shad body um, crankbaits. And I have some examples of those right here. So these, as you can see, they have the two treble hooks, one of the most normal features of these. But when I turn them this way, you can see there's no bill on there. And the point of contact is not on the front, it's actually on top. And so what this does is instead of having the bill direct and give the control, the top of this, if you can see it here, the top of that is kind of flat right there. Top of this one, it's a little more rounded, but you can see that flat edge. And so by having the point for your line to attach here, whenever it gets pulled through the water, it'll turn the nose down and we'll go ahead and cause it to have uh, a lot of action here. So whenever you have that, it's, it's also got a rattle in there. It's acting a lot like the normal crankbaits with the bills. Um, only one big thing about these is there's no bill to, to dictate depth. Um, so you get more into the issue of uh, that, you know, this one is heavier than the one in my left hand. So it's going to dive a little deeper. And it's also, if you pull it a little harder, give it stronger, you know, uh, uh, rod pulls, it's going to cause it to dive a little deeper. Um, so there's a, a little difference there. It's, it's not quite as adjustable as say, oh, well, I'm going to pull this crankbait out because it has a smaller lip and I'm in shallower water. Uh, these, you may have to do things like uh, change your retrieval speed. Um, so there's a, a little more fine tuning on the part of the fishermen having to be aware of, of where they are and what they have. see so um I've, I've been talking a lot about these i've got one more group of these that i want to talk about but uh you know when we look at these lures some people are going to think well what kind of fish are these successful for fishing for and the, the good news is that most of these are going to be effective against or for uh, a wide variety of species these aren't just bass lures um, i've caught catfish on a crankbait uh, you catch sunfish on a smaller one, you know, something like this, the small trout one that I was looking at. Um, this is going to be something good you could use for bluegill, any other kind of small sunfish. Um, it's small enough that it's enticing to them. They're not going to be, uh, you know, thinking, ah, there's no way I can get that. Uh, so that kind of broadens it. Again, this grasshopper here, that's something that would also be su successful for sunfish uh all varieties of bass um so it's not necessarily one species specific i know i said i use this for spotted bass and smallmouth um, but these would certainly be effective for other species i've caught drum on uh, on crankbaits as well uh, drum catfish sunfish bass um, that's one thing i was talking about these being great because you can have them on hand ready to go and one of the other things is that these really are effective for a variety of fish. So if you're in an area, maybe you don't know a lot about, but you wanted to go out and fish it, this would be a good way to try to have a successful fishing experience uh, because it can cross a broad variety of species as far as getting them interested in, in, in having a bite, hopefully. So the last group that I wanna talk about is called jerk baits. And these are very similar to crank baits. Um, but they have a little bit of different features to them. Let me hold up this one here first. So not all, but a lot of these jerk baits are going to have three treble hooks. Some just have two, uh, but it's very common for them to have three. This long cylindrical body, very common shape for them to have. Some are going to be more round, maybe not quite so slender. Um, but the unifying thing with the crankbait is they have these bills on here. Now, these are not necessarily deep divers. In fact, they're mostly used to fish top water to, to somewhat uh, shallow diving. And again, the bill on the front is gonna dictate a lot of that movement. Here's one here, just for comparison, a more rounded shape on my, uh, your right side here. And this one has that diamond shape I was referring to earlier. So this one's gonna move a little more slowly to like slide wobble. This one's gonna move a little more erratically. Um, and that's just if you're doing a straight retrieve. So if I were to cast it out, you know, and reel down on it, this one would dive some and it would go deeper than this one. But 
the they get their name the jerk bait from the technique that's usually used to fish them uh, which is where you would cast it out and you would actually do a twitching motion kind of similar to the poppers i was talking about uh, so that's going to give them you know you can do it side to side or jerk and pause and reel and jerk and pause uh, so there's a couple different ways to fish these uh, but they're very effective um, they, th these long bodies to them, you know, they definitely look like a tasty bait fish, a good meal. Uh, these are going to be more so for bass than these other smaller ones that we've looked at. Uh, I've, I've not had any other species other than bass actually go for these. Uh, but for largemouth bass, definitely very attractive. Uh, another good option um, for going out there and trying to target bass if that is something that you're highly interested in. Um, and you can see just as the other ones, these come in a variety of patterns. There's another one here, a little more simple design to it. This one, again, looking like a rainbow trout here. This one kind of have a long shad body. So that is the majority of, you know, the common ones that you're going to see. There's going to be variations on these things. There always is. And that's why this information is kind of as a way to get you started into these lures. If it's something you're not familiar with, um, I just want to be able to help you. If you have any questions, you know, narrow down uh, what type, what size, you know, et cetera, et cetera, is trying to get it more accessible to you so that you can have some options. And like I said, you know, if you have these in your tackle box, they're not going to go bad. They're not going to rot. Uh, they're just going to be there ready to go. And so that's why I really recommend people who maybe you don't like using live bait or you don't always know when you're going to go fishing, you have time and you want to go out and explore, um, you know, these are great to have on you. Um, so uh, at this point, I guess I'm going to just going to open it to questions. Um, we're just after 6.30 or at 6.37 here. Um, so definitely, uh, if you guys have any questions, please put them into the chat and I will uh, answer them as they, as they come in. See over here, um, got a comment from someone about brown trout, uh, brown trout, brown trout hitting jerk baits, and um, you know these small rainbow trout patterns. You know that's definitely a good way to get them uh, enticed, as that's another common food source for brown trout. So they'll definitely go for those. Um, let me see what else I got here. Best time of year to use a, a jerk bait? I see that here. Um, the, the answer on that is really anytime. Um, I, I, I usually would do it more in the warmer months, um, but I hear reports of other fishermen who have great success with them during the winter. Uh, I know that, you know, when it gets warm, fish are going to move to deeper water for cooler temperatures and kind of the opposite. Uh, when it gets cold, they'll come up to the top to get a little more warmth. And so when it's cold like that and you're working those jerk baits, those fish are maybe more likely to come up and get it. Um, you know, that being said, fish get a little more lethargic when it's cold. Um, so, you know, it might take some extra finesse to get them to actually bite. And like I said, using those different techniques uh, could help you be more successful because, you know, maybe you have it out there and you're just doing a side to side and then just kind of working it back slowly. Uh, maybe, you know, when it's colder, you could consider something like casting and doing a, a slight retrieve or a pull on it and then pausing. And that pause will give time for that fish to react to it, uh, which, you know, sometimes is an issue when you're fishing in colder water. Uh, they asked, what crankbaits have I caught catfish on? And actually, th this one right here, it's called a bomber. Uh, I have caught one on this actual lure, uh, catfish. And, you know, the coloration there, it's, I'm not sure what was honing in for that catfish, but he did bite this one. Um, other ones though, are going to be equally successful. Uh, there's not always a great, uh, way to know what they're going to bite on as far as the pattern that you're presenting. Um, like I said, you know, there's something to consider for the water conditions as far as clarity. And in this case, when I was fishing that it was, a, it was a pretty dirty stream. Uh, it was, you know, a stream running between some farm fields, had a lot of runoff. Um, so it was, it was dirty. 
And uh, I think what really enticed him was I was retrieving it along the bank. And I think the, that percussive activity that I was talking about, uh, I think that's what really clued in. And he just took a chance on it and bit that. Um, but I don't know. Oh, actually, this one here, too. This lipless. I, I did catch a fish, a catfish, um, on this one. And this one, it has the rattle in it. These you'll hear sometimes called referred to as a rattle trap. Um, and I actually did have a catfish on this one as well. This was on Christmas day of last year. Uh, we had unusually warm temperatures. So I went uh, to the spillway in Mayflower, Arkansas, and I caught a good sized channel catfish on this. Um, and again, you know, this is more of a shad kind of color and it's got that nice reflective color to it. Um, that water is not particularly clear. Um, so in this case, it could have been both. It could have been the color and this rattle activity that really enticed him to come and try, uh, you know, to get a bite. Um, so that's, that's at least two that I can speak of for sure that I've, I've had success with for catfish. Um, that being said, if, if, if I were personally targeting catfish, I wouldn't necessarily use one of these, um, but it does speak in the fact that I've had that experience, it speaks to their diversity and the ability to catch a broad range of fish. So it's a good place to, to start. Let me look at some of these other questions here. Difference between lipless crankbait, blade or lipless crankbait and blade bait. Okay, um, honestly, that's a great question because they function very similarly. So one thing is being metal. This uh, blade bait is going to sink pretty much as deep as it can go. And so one thing that's going to give you an advantage on if I'm fishing deep water, this will go down as far as I let it. And there's a technique called jigging where you can do just a quick retrieve vertically. And these actually work pretty well for that. Um, whereas this lipless crankbait, this is going to be more just a retrieving. And so it's not going to dive deep. Um, it's only going to dive as, as much as its weight and your retrieval speed will dictate. So this is something that is good. Um, but this one has a little more versatility just depending on where you're at and, and what you're trying to fish for. Um, but as far as the action that they provide, they actually do have just a very similar motion. Um, blade baits, they're a little more erratic. There's a little tighter shake to it, whereas the lipless one, it's a little bit slower, um, but they have very similar motions as far as their action of the water. John, I'm going to try to help you out a little bit. Yeah, what you got? It's, um, next question is, what's the biggest catfish you've caught? Oh, I mean, probably, I think it was like an 18-pound channel. I, I, I didn't weigh it. <laughs> this is, okay. At that time, I wasn't really concerned about weighing it, but it, it was good size. And uh, that was, that was uh, Jacqueline Hamilton was also wanting to know, which of these will punch through heavier fauna on top or heavy growth area? Okay. Um, that And that's something to be concerned with when you're looking at these. I mean, especially something like, like this. I mean, those three treble hooks, that's a great thing to get hung up on everything that's in the water. Um, so good question and very fair giving this type of lure. And one of the biggest things I would say about that is it's going to be heavily dependent on the line that you're using. So a lot of bass fishermen will use, um, if they're fishing heavy cover, will use braided line. And braided line is significantly stronger than monofilament or uh, fluorocarbon. And so it's going to give you a lot better chance to get things out of thick brush, lily pads, um, you know, any kind of uh, like top surface level, uh, but then also any kind of lower aquatic vegetation. It'll help uh, get that through there. Um, you know, not any one of these in particular is going to be easy to get if it's a treble hook. But there are, let me see. Which one had this? There are other hooks that you can put on these. Like I said, that's one of the benefits of these is that the body you can use over and over again, but then if you have issues or maybe you wanna modify it, you can put different hooks on these. And so this one here, this is just two hooks on one side and you can attach these and help them lift over vegetation. And so that will help a little bit if you're in a heavy cover area and you're concerned about that, you, and you know you're gonna be fishing that, you could switch to a hook like that 
Um, but really, uh, in my experience, and I, and I think kind of just broadly, having a stronger line is going to give you a better chance of retrieving it from heavy vegetation of any kind. Next question is, is catfish typically caught on crankbait or is bass the primary target with crankbaits? Bass is the primary target, I would say. Um, catfish, that's kind of a bycatch. And like I said, if I were personally going out to target catfish, I, I wouldn't initially go to a crankbait. Um, it's not that it's you know not possible to catch a catfish, but they use different um, senses to really find their, you know, food or whatever they're wanting to, to eat on. Um, they, they, they're going to go a lot more by taste and scent in the water. Uh, whereas all these lures are really going off of uh, sound, the percussion and, and visual cues. So it's, it's possible. Like I said, I, I have caught them on there, but by and large, it's going to be bass, um, like I said, I have caught a drum on one, um, but then bass and, and sunfish are are definitely the ones that are most likely to hit it because they're predator fish and they're they're going to be more active in attacking and seeking out those lures. All right. Next question is: Which kind of lures would you recommend for use in different places to fish? River versus stream versus pond versus lake. Okay, that's a good question. Um, and you know, uh, let's say. Let's consider it more for deep water versus shallow water. Um, you know, these, these blades, blade baits, or these spoons, these are nice because they will quickly descend into the water. Um, so if you're on a large lake or even a deep river, this is something that you could use to get down to where the fish you're trying to target are at. Um, so that's one benefit of them is just being able to get to deeper levels quicker. Uh, but then also as you're retrieving them, they'll, they'll stay there. They're not going to come up as fast as something that has some buoyancy inherent to the material. So, you know, this, where is the large one I had? This guy, he, he's made to dive deep and there are ones that are made to dive deeper. Uh, so they have these large bills and you can certainly pull it and it'll get it down into the water. Uh, but you have two issues working against you there. And that's, you know, you're, you're using up your line. So you're going to cast out as far as you can, but if you're deep water, you know, half of your line, this thing's diving, diving, diving. Well, you're going to reach a point where the angle changes and then it's coming back up to wherever you are, either on a boat or on the shore. And so you kind of lose how much time this is at that deeper level. Um, so that's kind of a, a benefit of using those blade baits or spoons is they're going to be further down in the water uh, pretty much the whole time that you're retrieving them. Um, and again, depth on the other side, say you're fishing shallow water. Well, this guy isn't going to do much for you. He's probably going to get you hung up, especially if it's like a, a, a river or stream bottom that's heavy with debris. Um, you know, this is something that could easily get caught on a, a log or something like that down there. So you want to try to limit necessarily how far down this is going into the water. So if I had any familiarity with the stream, I would maybe go with something shallower the smaller bill is going to prevent you from getting hung up so easily uh, on any debris on the bottom. Um, but then again, you know, actually I have this on my hand, say I'm fishing a small stream and it's got a rocky bottom. I would want this thing, this crawfish pattern, I would want it hitting the bottom continually uh, as I'm retrieving it because that's the natural uh, action and swimming motion of a crawfish is to seek cover in between rocks in the stream. Um, but again, that's a little more knowing the, the area that you're fishing. You can make good guesses about where you're at to try to help you with the depth of the water. Um, but, you know, the more you know as far as what they're looking for and the, the, the area that you're fishing, the better you can select the, the lure you're trying to use. Um, but generally, if you're concerned about any depth issues, uh, a swift retrieve will keep you off the bottom. Um, so that's something to, to consider, too. You're not always going to get hung up on the bottom. Um, and if you keep just a swift retrieve, you can, you can usually avoid that if you're not totally sure where you're at. All right. Next question. How do you go about gauging what baits to use when in a new area you haven't fished and you don't know? When you use a shallow dive baits versus deeper diving, how do you choose the type of action? Uh, I would usually go for kind of a mid range and, you know, say, I'm not going to go the big guy here, but I'm not going to go something small. You know, I might go a little more in the middle, something like this. 
And if I'm reeling it and I'm reeling it pretty fast, um, I will know when this is making contact, you'll actually feel it hit the bottom. Um, and if you're reeling fast, the benefit of that is that it's going to keep it more angled up, which is going to help keep your hooks off the bottom. And so, you know, if I'm reeling him in really fast and I can feel him hitting, that can kind of help me gauge how deep it is. Um, but generally, again, if you're doing just a, a nice, consistent retrieve, you can kind of uh, prevent getting hung up. Um, but again, that's, that's not always 100% possible to know everything in the water. Uh, you know, that's the downside of uh, fishing in streams that aren't particularly clear. Uh, and when, you know, in Arkansas, there's plenty of streams that aren't. Uh, but it's nice when you do have clear streams because you can kind of help, uh, you know, fill that out ahead of time. Um, but it, it really is, it's something you will become more familiar with after you start using them. But, you know, if you go to the store and you see something that says it's a two to five foot dive, uh, you know, diver on a crankbait, that's a pretty safe lure to use anywhere. And like I said, if you do a nice steady retrieve, you'll, you'll feel it hitting if it's that shallow. All right. Next question. I think you've answered part of it already. Part okay. of it is what are blade baits good for. And like you said, it keeps the, the bait down there at the bottom, closer to the bottom for a longer distance of time. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that, you know, and it's just the variety of technique that you could fish it. Uh, I was talking about that jigging motion. So say if I'm in a, in a boat in this case and I'm fishing straight down rather than doing a retrieve and just coming back to me, I can kind of just do slight upward motions with the rod tip. And if, say if I know that there's some structure in the water, maybe a, an old tree or stump um, and I could get next to it and just literally drop it next to it and kind of give it an up and down motion, give it time to go back down and give it another rip up. Um, that's a good way to get, you know, action out of fish holding up around any kind of structure under the water. Um, so that's, that's really their benefit is that they're more versatile for, for fishing styles. Todd, my, uh, Todd also wants to know where's the best place to catch bass and don't tell him. Oh. <laughs> um, I mean, uh, they're, they're all over the state. Uh, all, tournament fishers of course are going to be on lakes. Um, you know, and the issues with lakes is that you got to cover more water sometimes to find those pockets. Uh, I'm, I myself, I love fishing streams, you know, small rivers and or large creeks, if you look at it that way, um, because the bass are usually going to be somewhat around structure and they're usually easy to find in those streams. And I can kind of key on to what they're wanting to, to eat more often. Um, so, you know, with a lot of fish, you're going to be fishing structure, um, any kind of maybe a waterway feeding into another one. Those are good areas to look at because they're waiting for food to flow downstream, you know, whether it be a bait fish or, or whatever. Um, so that's a good way to, to kind of locate bass. Um, but, you know, if you're talking about going to uh, a lake, a larger lake, you might want to look for vegetation, uh, buck brush, stuff like that. Um, you know, down trees, cypress trees. Uh, there's, you know, really still kind of the same idea, but it changes what that structure looks like. All right. Next question. Jacqueline is looking for a little bit of an advantage here. She wants to know okay. where you go to catch smallies this weekend. Um, really popular location, Crooked Creek. Um, another one is the Caddo down near Hot Springs. Uh, that's really popular for smallmouth also if you're in central or southern Arkansas. Uh, the, the Big Piney, uh, I, and this is from what I've been told, not that I, that I know, um, but the Big Piney is in another location that's supposed to be really good. Um, they're, you know, going to be in the more small stream systems, small river systems. Um, you're not really going to run into a lot of lakes that have small, small mouth in them. So. Is there any particular brand that you prefer and you purchase more of when it comes to. Uh, no, no, I, I really don't think so. Um, I kind of look for what, you, you know, if I've been out fishing, and like I said, you kind of, the more experience that you have, you'll start noticing where you're running into gaps and in maybe the lures that you have. Um, so sometimes that's a good thing to, to really pay attention to uh, is, you know, you're out fishing, maybe you weren't productive, but you noticed that they were eating or feeding on something in particular there. You can go back and then say, well, okay, what is this, what is this similar to that I know these fish are trying to eat? Um, and that's going to change depending on the time of the year. 
Um, but that's, that's usually what dictates my choices is I say, well, you know, I've, I've fished a lot of this pattern and didn't have a lot of luck, or, you know, I saw them eating these types of other bait fish here in this location. Um, so I'm going to go try to find something that matches that. Uh, and that's, you know, this, this small little trout, uh, pattern crankbait. I bought that because I had a feeling that, you know, small sunfish will eat other sunfish. And so this was something I thought would probably have a pretty broad application and, and it does. Uh, it's not because the, the sunfish that I'm catching on it are used to eating trout. It's just that it's kind of got a similar colors, those bars on its side. Um, it's small, gives a nice little action in the water. Um, so just kind of cluing into what is productive or not productive when you're fishing is going to help you know, help you hone in what your, what your lure selection should be like. All right. Uh, we're, we're getting pretty close to time. Uh, we had an hour time allotment for this. So, uh, it's six 55 now, six 56. Um, so I'm going to do, let me try to get two more questions real quick. See what we can get. We had one. I'm still fairly new to the state. Any suggestions on how to go to, about finding good streams to fish. Yeah, uh, uh, actually our website, uh, I'm sorry. You can give them some recommendations, but I also posted inside the chat. Uh, yeah. To our word of fish from our yes. fish website. Yes, our website is gonna be a, a great resource. Uh, our GIS team, they have locations um, that you can go and see what kind of access those bodies of water or streams have. Um, and that's where I would direct you uh, I don't know exactly what area of the state you're in. Um, so that's going to be a big part of it is, you know, time, you know, what's available to you immediately. Uh, do you have time to travel for that? Um, what time of the year is it? Do you want to go to that location? Um, so there, there's a lot of factors there, but luckily um, other members and other divisions in our agency have put together a nice uh, cohesive uh, mapping system that can help you get in the right direction. But also don't be afraid, you know, that being said, I don't know what your accessibility is like, um, but don't be afraid to try out, you know, places on the side of the road. If there's a safe place to pull over and park and you see a stream and there's no signs telling you not to, you would be surprised how many good fish you can pull out of streams everywhere in Arkansas. Last question I have here is what color or colors do you recommend on water clarity and cloud cover when choosing a bait? Water clarity and cloud cover. Well, like I said, it's going to be kind of a broad application there. Um, so let's say water clarity in individually. You know, if it's you know more turbid or, or darker, cloudy water, or whether that be dirty or you know any other kind of stain to the water, uh, I'll usually fish brighter colors. Um, you know, brighter colors or something with maybe not a brighter color. But uh, getting tangled up on my hooks here, but something with a lot of flash, you can see that iridescent quality to it. So either something with a lot of flash or bright color is, is going to help you in that situation because they may be able to find it or hone in on a little bit with that percussive activity. Um, but a little brighter presentation will help them find it for sure. Um, whereas, you know, when you get into clear water, you're going to have a lot more issues with uh, the fish being more picky, uh, you know, fish have great eyesight and they are certainly aware of what their favorite food source is, or at least what the most common food source is. Um, so they're going to seek that out. And I have seen it uh, plenty of times where I brought an assortment of lures and tried to catch fish that I could see in the water, but you know, what I was throwing, they, they weren't biting. Um, so it can be frustrating, um, but again, that's part of the learning process is you try to diversify the lures that you have and be aware of the food sources that are in their streams. Um, so that's a good way to combat any kind of picky fish if you have a nice clear stream that you're fishing in or a clear lake, uh, clear lakes like Washita. Um, so there's things like that to consider. Cloud cover that's not going to really play as big of a role as like the water quality, uh, but kind of the same thing. You, you definitely want there to be, uh, uh, you want to catch light. So that iridescent quality I was talking about, uh, that's a big thing. And if it's cloudy, um, something that's kind of a matte color won't necessarily catch the light. 
Uh, here's another one I didn't show on camera yet, but you can see all that iridescent patterning on it. And so you want to just try to catch as much light as possible. So on a cloudy day, rather than going something like this, which has no iridescent markings on it, it's a matte finish. It's bright colored, uh, but it doesn't have any real flash to it, as we would say. So then you see something like this and you're like, wow, that's got a lot more. It's hitting all the lights in my, in my kitchen right here. Um, so that's a good way to kind of, you know, help ensure that you're going to get a reaction out of the fish on a cloudy day. And uh, it's, it's seven o'clock. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and end it here, but I wanted to say thank you to everyone that attended and, you know, hopefully I answered some of your questions. I know it's a, it's a big subject to, to approach, uh, but we'll hopefully do some other uh, continuations of this soon. Uh, so we could, you know, get into stuff like spinner baits and uh, soft plastics, which are a whole nother world of uh, artificial lures, but also will just give you a better opportunity to, to go and uh, find what the fish prefer and hopefully have a more productive fishing trip. Um, so thank you again for everyone to come tonight.